the, the agenda. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Paul Hicks, and I'm the Acting Manager of Planning for the County of Elgin, and I'll be facilitating tonight's meeting. Um, we're about to begin tonight's open house, and to do so, I'd like to invite Warden Ketchupa to bring greetings on behalf of County Council. And so in doing so, I'll pass the mic over to you, Mr. Warden. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here present in uh, live, as well as those who have joined us virtually this evening. Now, on behalf of Elgin County Council, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for this open house for Elgin County's official plan. The county official plan is an important planning document. This is something that will serve us for the next 20 years. And this uh, open house provides a great opportunity for you to learn more about what the official plan is and this project and what's proposed in this new official plan. I want to also make comment that uh, Elgin's first official plan was, uh, you know, instituted back in 2013. And so that's quite some time ago. And this uh, review process has been underway for quite some time. Uh, a few global events got in the way, COVID-19 for one of them. And, uh, you know, successive planners have been working on this. We're quite grateful to have Paul and his team helping us uh, get through this particular review so that we can launch into uh, the new document further or later on this spring. So with that, I will pass this back over to you, Paul, and uh, thank you in advance for uh, leading us through this. Hey, thanks so much, Warden Ketchaba. Happy to be here tonight with everybody. So with that, before we get started, I'd like to do a round of formal introductions to some of the people involved in both the projects and tonight's presentation. As I've mentioned previously, my name is Paul Hicks and I'm the principal of an urban planning firm called Republic Urbanism. And we've been assisting the county with their planning services, including the development of the new official plan, while the county has been recruiting a new director of planning. Tonight, I'm joined virtually by my colleague, Jesse McPhail, who is an urban planner at our firm, who's also been assisting and providing planning services to the county. And he is the R that you'll see down in, in, in one of the blocks on your screen. And Jesse's just, I think, turning on his mic to say a quick hello. Thanks, Jesse. On this project, we were also joined by Paul Clark, who's a planning technician for the county, as well as Tyson Edwards, who prepared the official plan maps for, for, this, um, for, for, for the document. Not listed on this slide, but equally important this evening, we have Catherine Thompson and Stephanie Hyde at the county offices who are assisting and facilitating members of the public who have attended this, uh, this presentation as open house in person at the county offices. I'd like to begin this evening with a brief outline of why we're here today. The purpose of this open house is to provide an opportunity for anyone who wishes to learn more about the county's official plan project and the proposed new official plan. This meeting is also intended to fulfill the county's statutory obligations under the Planning Act, which requires municipalities to hold at least one public open house during the development of a new official plan. Again, the purposes of tonight are twofold. It's to help members of the Elgin County community to understand what an official plan is and to understand what is being proposed in the official plan. And that's also intended to fulfill our statutory obligations under the Planning Act. This open house is structured around two presentations. The first is an introductory presentation, which will cover topics such as what is an official plan? How does an official plan work as part of the larger planning system? As well as discussing why the county is reviewing the official plan now and how this project has progressed. The second presentation will focus on the proposed official plan itself and highlights the major changes between the current official plan and the proposed official plan. Between each presentation, there'll be approximately 30 minute question period where you can ask questions and seek clarification on anything discussed here tonight. At the beginning of each question and answer period, we'll provide instructions as to how to ask questions through the Zoom platform that we're using this evening. If you do participate in the question and answer period, you're asked to keep your question or comment brief to permit as many people as possible to participate. And please note that any disruptive or disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated and may result with you being removed from the open house. So let's get started. And let's start at the beginning. So what is an official plan? 
Technically speaking, an official plan is a document that constitutes a municipality statement of land use policy, and it's primarily composed of two parts. Land use policies, which form the, the written content of the document, and maps that designate lands for various uses, such as agricultural, residential, or industrial uses. Councils across Ontario develop and implement official plans normally for three primary reasons. The first is to develop a roadmap or a blueprint for development and infrastructure that are planned across a municipality to ensure that land and resources are being used wisely and efficiently. The second is to make sure that councils have a consistent approach to making decisions on land use and development proposals, and not just one-off decisions that may conflict with previous decisions. The third reason is to make sure that best practices are employed in land development and resource management to help municipalities achieve a wide range of goals and objectives. They can include housing objectives, economic and development objectives, or environmental objectives. Official plans can be developed at many different scales or levels of detail. There can be national or provincial official plans. In Ontario's case, that document is called the Provincial Policy Statement. There can also be regional official plans that might be focused on a regional watershed or maybe a large integrated geographic area, like the Greater Toronto's Horseshoes plan, for, pardon me, the Greater Toronto Area's plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. There can also be municipal plans like each local municipality in Elgin has. And there can also be neighborhood plans that focus on specific geographic areas within, within a municipality. The Elgin County official plan is best described as being a regional plan. So what do we mean by that? This is because it covers a large geographic area encompassing the county's seven local municipalities. And this is important to note because this impacts the type of issues that the county plan attempts to address, which tend to be regional in nature such as the management of the county's large agricultural land base, the county road system, regional economic development, and the protection of natural features, as all of these issues have cro are cross-jurisdictional in nature, meaning that they just don't end at, in an individual municipality's boundaries. This contrasts with a local official plan, such as a Southwold official plan or the Elmer official plan, which are focused on issues that impact these municipalities and communities specifically, such as how much commercial land do each municipality need? How do we revitalize our downtowns and main streets or where our park should be located? So why are official plans important? Well, they're passed under the authority of the Planning Act, which means they have legislative authority. The Act also requires that land use and infrastructure decisions made by municipal councils comply with the policies and designations in the plan. So no decision can be made that conflicts with the plan and this impacts where development goes and, or how we supply infrastructure to service it. It's also important to note that official plans are only one part of a larger planning system in Elgin. And this is primarily composed of three distinct parts. The provincial level, which you can see at the top, the county level in the middle, and the local level at the bottom. And this diagram illustrates how these levels work together and also the level of detail and direction that are found at each level, starting at the top with, with the province's high level plans and policies direction and down to the local level's detailed policy, plan, policy directions and permitting. So you can see that the county plan sits in the middle of being high level and detailed level. So when the county makes decisions on development proposals, such as plans of subdivision, condominium, or the severance of land, the county council has to take into account the province's plan, such as the provincial policy statement, the county's own official plan, which we're looking at developing a new one this evening, as well as the plan for the respective local municipalities where the development is taking place in. And as I mentioned, there are seven municipalities in Elkin County that each have their own local official plan. So a little bit about why the county is undertaking the development of a new plan today. And there are three primary reasons for this, some of which were mentioned by Warden Ketchaba. First, the Planning Act requires that municipalities in Ontario review and update their official plans every five years. 
The second is that it's been over 12 years since the County Council adopted the current official plan and a lot has changed since then. We've had COVID as well as the COVID recovery, housing crises and growing, um, growing climate change crises. Finally, the county also wants to ensure that there's enough land needed for new homes to address the housing crisis, as well as to accommodate new business and industry. To undertake the development of the new official plan, the county has embarked on a long journey that began in 2021 with identifying what issues the county wanted to tackle in developing their new official plan. Phase two of the project involved in-depth study of these issues and the preparation of a number of background reports that you can find online at Engage Elgin. This also included such things as the development of population projections to understand how far, how quickly the, the municipality is growing and the demographics of the, of the county, as well as how much land the county and its local municipalities are going to need to grow over a 20 to 30 year period. Phase three of the project involved the drafting of the new official plan and public and stakeholder commenting on the plan when the plan where the plan was refined and edited based on the feedback that we received. So the first draft of the official plan was posted online for public commenting in the spring of last year. And so since that time, we've taken the comments that were received from the public, as well as a number of different agencies, including uh, Canadian National Railways, the local municipalities, Conservation Authority, um, et cetera. And we've refined and edited that plan based on the feedback that we received. We're now in phase four, where we're looking at finalizing the plan and preparing it for approval by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And one of these steps is to host the open house that we're holding tonight. So that concludes our introductory presentation. And at this time, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions or comments that you might have on what an official plan is, how Elgin's planning system works, or the project's progress. If you've not used Zoom before, for those that are joining us virtually, there are two ways that you can ask a question. First, you can raise your hand and our team will then identify you and unmute you so you can ask a question. At the bottom of your screen, if you hover your cursor over it, you'll see a menu that should pop up that will either include a icon that says raise your hand or it might say reactions. And if you see reactions, you can also click on it and then you'll have the choice of selecting raise your hand. The other way is along the same menu, you'll see a chat function. And if you click on that, a dialogue box will open up and you can ask your question in writing. Jesse, who has been monitoring both the chats and those that have raised their hands, will call on you and will unmute you to speak. If you are present, physically present in the council chambers and would like to ask a question or provide a comment, we would ask that you please present yourself to Catherine and Stephanie, who can um, ensure that your question gets gets asked. So with that, um, I'll maybe turn the mic over to Jesse um, and Stephanie and Catherine, if you'd like to advise if there are any questions or comments from members of the public. Uh, hey, Paul. Okay. So this is Jesse here. Yes. I don't have any hands raised or any uh, questions asked in the chat yet, but uh, maybe I'll pass it over to the folks at the uh, the county office. We have no questions at this time. Oh, actually, Thanks so much. Uh, as I said that, as I said that, someone came in. Uh, so we have a question here uh, that uh, that I'll read out, Paul, and then uh, I'll pass Please. the mic to you. Uh, so we have someone who's asked, uh, were there any updates or revisions to forecasts based on VW plan announcement? Ah, yes, of course. Um, so this is for, for the benefit of everybody. Um, I believe this question is related to, uh, as I had mentioned, when we were developing the official plan and when the county was developing the official plan, they hired an outside consulting firm, which is very common in, in these cases called um, Hemson Consulting. And Hemson um, prepared the population projections and the land needs assessment. So that's the, the those are the projections that determine how much population we believe is going to be located in the county within 20 to 30 years time, and also how much land we believe we're going to need to accommodate that population, as well as any new employment that's coming into the municipality because of that population. 
And when we undertook that assessment, that was prior to the announcement of the new VW plant being located in St. Thomas. And when that does happen, such those, those types of major, um, major um, economic announcements can have impacts on the amount of new people that may be coming to Elgin County to seek employment opportunities and can impact the amount of land that we need to, to, to grow. So it's a really great question to ask. Did we consider the impacts or did we revise the population projections and land needs assessment based on based on the um, the new VW plant announcement being made? And the answer is yes. And that's one of the reasons that um, the plan has taken a little bit longer to prepare over the past year to get to this point than we originally envisioned. And part of that was because after the announcement was made, we did go back to Hemson Consulting and ask them to prepare an addendum or to review their projections and land needs assessment to make sure that we had properly accounted for the increased um, economic activity and the increase in population that we anticipate being located specifically within Elgin County over the planning horizon of the plans, that kind of 20 to 30 year period. Because we also expect that some of that population will also likely locate within the city of St. Thomas, the city of London, as well as Middlesex County, and even some of the broader region beyond that. So uh, to, to answer that question, I can confirm that we did undertake revisions and an addendum to that report. Um, the individual that asked the question, if you are interested in seeing the results of that, um, they, the results of the, that addendum and that, that supplementary report can be found on Engage Elgin, um, the Engage Elgin website where you access this link. Um, so if you scroll down through the documents and postings that are located there, you should be able to see the, the addendum that was done or the, the revision that was done to those population projections. Thank you very much. Maybe call it one last time for any questions or comments on the initial presentation. Otherwise, I'm happy to uh, to move on to the, the the next presentation. We we do have another question. They're going to go up to the podium. Great. Uh, just a follow up to that question. Do they have the exact date those projections were made? Like, was it before the COVID? Because after we had COVID, we had a building boom in St. Thomas. Like, was that accounted for? Yes. So the population projections, the original study that was done by Hemson was done after COVID had happened. So it was actually, um, it was completed in uh, 2022. Um, and then we did a revision to take into account the VW plant being located in St. Thomas in the summer of 2023. So the, they, it was completed post COVID uh, uh, again, two years after, after kind of the start of the pandemic. On that question then, what, what is the uh, expected change in growth? You have that number there? I, I don't have the specific numbers um, at hand. I can certainly look those up. And again, they are available on, on the, um, the municipality's website. For direct, as a direct result, I'm going to state this, but you can't quote me on it. And you can certainly double check the, the numbers that I'm going to give you. But I believe it was in the two to 300 person range that we were anticipating would be directly as a result of the VW plant coming into to the county. Again, also we need to remember with that is that that growth is also intended to be accounted for in the city of St. Thomas that is separate from the county. So it's not involved. They do their own population projections and land needs assessment. They're, they're jurisdictionally separate. Um, so they will they will also conduct their own analyses, as will the city of London, as will Middlesex County, as to what is expected in terms of direct population growth um, that would be forthcoming from 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 the the economic announcement. OK, Paul, if you wouldn't mind clarifying, you talked about 200 uh, units. Now, you were not talking about population. You're talking about residential units, correct? Oh, sorry. No, that would be, I believe the, uh, pardon me. Yes, that is correct. That two to 300 additional housing units. Pardon me. Paul, I do have another question from the chat here. Um, so it's just with respect to Bill 23. So uh, someone asking, is there any consideration for delay of extension of final issuance based on Bill 23 potential reading? Um, so Bill 23, um, 
if we're speaking about the same bill 23 um that bill has already come into effect um so we wouldn't be planning on 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 delaying any further um the implement that bringing forward the um bringing forward the official plan uh if I could be quite frank, it's uh, this has been a very dynamic period in in <laughs> in planning in in Ontario. Um, so we've had a number of substantial changes to both provincial uh, legislation and policies. Um, we have tried our best, particularly uh, to wait for um, the new provincial policy statement to come out. Um, but we're at a stage, um, and we presented this in front of council as well, too, um, that we don't believe that we can continue to wait for the provincial government um, to complete their reforms of the planning system. Um, so we're going to have to, from our perspective, and this is an administrative question almost, but we would have to move forward with the plan as it is right now. And if we do have to make amendments to the plan to address changes in policy or legislation, we'll have to uh, introduce those changes when 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 they when they're approved um, and they, uh, they they're presented to us. I hope that provides some clarity on that. Again, do another call out for any questions or comment. Oh, Thank you. There might I see somebody might be coming uh, to the podium there. All I wanted to ask you whether the projections you made on population and land needs were allocated uh, to the lower tier municipalities, and if they were, maybe you can enlighten me. I'm particularly interested in Central Elgin. What they what they are. Certainly. Um, so there is a slide that um, I'll come to where we'll show actually in the next presentation um, what the population projections do look like, as well as the amount of land um, that's designated for development purposes in all the local municipalities, um, as well as uh, what is needed, um, because ultimately what we end up with is either a surplus or a deficit of land in each municipality in order to accommodate new population growth. And for the most part, um, the, the county has an excess of, of residential um, and industrial lands needed to, to accommodate population growth. So through this exercise, um, we, we are not contemplating um, um, requiring any of the local municipalities to to increase their supply because they're 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 at this time is a an excess of supply a surplus of lands um, to accommodate that that population growth the exception to that is the the town of Elmer um, which is hemmed in by its corporate boundary with ma the surrounding Malahide Township. Mal uh, Elmer has a deficit of residential lands of approximately 20 hectares or about 50 acres of land. Um, so there's going to be some need for some detailed discussions with the town of Elmer as to how um, they're going to uh, are going to address the deficiency of land or how they'd like to address their deficiency of land. Um, but I will be covering the um, the actual amount of land, and I can highlight for you um, the amount of land that's needed for Central Elgin based on the population projections for Central Elgin, um, as well as Central Elgin's existing supply of land. And I, as, and I, I put point, re reiterate, I can put that out that I will be coming to a slide um, when, shortly where I can where I can highlight that. Just to confirm, and I think I know the answer, you're saying that for the projections you made for future population growth for the planning period, which is what, 20 years? Yes. Uh, there's enough land residentially and for industrial purposes currently across the board from west to east without uh, any municipality other than Elmer having to address a deficiency. That's correct. According to the projections that were completed by Henson in 2022 and then revisited in 2023, that there is an excess or a surplus of land um, across the county in all municipalities to accommodate the 20 to 30 year growth requirements, with the exception of the town of Elmer, which has a deficiency. And that's what the county plan is prepared to uh, assume and adopt. That's correct. That's the basis for the for, for for the growth management. And then can a municipality reallocate within its Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's a common thing that does happen. What we tend to see within, um, particularly in, in rural municipalities in Ontario or rural regions like Elgin County, 
they tend to, for various reasons, have, and I'll, I'll often call them kind of legacy designations, um, maybe very ambitious councils that back in the 1970s or 80s had designated very large swaths of land for development that, um, that never ultimately occurred. Um, so we often see rural regions like Elgin uh, with an excess or a surplus of lands. And so what a local municipality can do is to kind of go and rejig and replace the, the pie pieces and move them around um, in, into locations that maybe um, have better servicing or better access to transportation infrastructure. But at any time, a local municipality um, can undertake that exercise. And I can say um, we have recently approved, uh, but the County of Elgin had recently approved official plans in Southwold um, and Central Elgin where some of that rejigging did, did occur and that was presented to council. Um, and Dutton Dunwich is undertaking kind of a similar exercise as is West Elgin of wanting to move those, some of those puzzle pieces around to make sure that they're located in areas that will be best able to accommodate that growth, either through infrastructure servicing, transportation, or just community amenity. Thank you. Of course. Is there any, um, I'll maybe do another call out for any questions and otherwise I'm happy to move on to the next um, the next uh, presentation. Doesn't look like there's any more in the chat here, um, but if, if they do come up, uh, folks, don't sure. be afraid to enter them in there and, and we'll hang on to them and we can we can present them at the next uh, the next Q&A. Are we good over at the county um, um, county chambers or council chambers? I mean, are there any more questions? I see none at this time. Very good. Okay, and we'll continue on. And again, if a if a question does pop into anybody's head, well, while the second presentation is happening, certainly we'll have another round of of question and answer, um, and we can certainly go back and cover any of the of the previous bases. Now we're going to move on to, into the second presentation of the evening where we'll dive a little bit deeper into the significant changes that are being proposed into the new official plan. And we're gonna tackle this a bit on a chapter by chapter basis. So respect, with respect to the kind of the general changes of the document, and so these are changes that are affect the overall layout and structure of the document. All of the policies and designations and land use designations that are contained in the plan were updated to comply with the Planning Act amendments that have been recently passed. And certainly we understand that additional Planning Act amendments may be coming forth and we may require additional changes to the plan as they as they come down. It, they were also brought up to date with respect to the provincial policy statement. Um, this would be the third iteration of the provincial policy statement that um, this plan, the existing plan has operated under. So it's a, this was a major change, the, the 2020 provincial policy statement. Um, so again, changes were made to bring it into compliance with the provincial policy statement and the planning act, um, as well as all current provincial and national development guidelines that exist. The existing community vision in the plan has been replaced to an approach built around 10 strategic directions that serve as the basis for the plan. So that's identifying issues such as growth management, um, economic development, housing, the agricultural and rural area, settlement areas, natural resource development, um, all form the 10 strategic directions. There's also a general housekeeping of language and terminology that was conducted throughout the entire document. The approach to this housekeeping and editing was really two part. One, there was an attempt to improve the use of plain language to increase the accessibility and readability of the plan by the public. So attempts were made as best as possible to eliminate as much jargon um, as we could or, or planning speak within the documents. Um, sometimes it is a little unavoidable as we do have to comply with provincial policy um, and, and provincial legislation in some instances, but we've done our best to, to make the, the, the document more um, easy to read and accessible um, by, by all parties. And we've also reduced the overall length of the document by removing a number of repetitive policies, uh, redundant language. And again, this was done to increase the readability of the plan by the public or by anybody who wants to undertake development in, in, in Elgin County. With respect to the first chapter, which is focused on the introduction, 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, the this includes the overview of the county to provide context to the reader. This overview is largely based on the previous vision statement that was contained in the current plan. We've also included a new explanation of Ontario's planning system and the relationship of the county plan, local official plans, and provincial policy statement to assist the reader in understanding how the planning system works and the place that the, the county official plan sits in with respect to the larger planning system. It also includes a new section outlining the structure of the plan and how it should be read and cross-referenced. And again, this is an attempt to make the plan easier to understand and to read by members of the public. Moving on to chapter two, this chapter is focused on growth management. So this is one of the, the 10 strategic pillars that I had mentioned the plan is focused on. Um, what you're seeing before you is the is the is essentially the growth management plan for the for the county of Elgin. Um, it highlights three tiers of municipalities that are located across the county. Um, the white areas and and those rep those are represented by the the per kind of purple and pinkish um, colors. The white area is the rural area or the agricultural land base that's located outside of all of the settlement areas. Um, the the structuring and the tiering of the municipalities and the way that that was tackled is is no change from the existing official plan. So when you see a municipality or pardon me, when you see a settlement area or a town that's listed as a tier one settlement area, that's essentially a, a, a community that has full municipal services, that has both water and sanitary sewer services to service new development. And that's where we want to see the majority of development um, directed to in the county as because, because these communities can best accommodate it. A tier two municipality, or pardon me, a tier two community is a community that may have municipal water or it may have municipal sewer service, but it doesn't have both. It's sometimes what we refer to as partial services. Um, these are perhaps maybe more preferable locations because they do have some municipal services um, that, uh, that, uh, that development can hook up to, but they're not fully serviced areas. And the, the third or the lowest um, on, on the tier is a tier three community these are often best described as likely our villages and hamlets that do not have any municipal water or sanitary sewer service at all. Um, so that means that um, the development in each of those communities are serviced by uh, individual wells or communal wells and individual or communal septic systems. These are the areas that are least able to accommodate new development. Um, and so they and so the policies reflect that again that we're attempting to direct development to areas and communities within the, the county that can accommodate um, that development with the, with infrastructure. Now this this next slide here um, shows the population projections. Um, so there was a question at, uh, during the their first presentation about what the the projected population of Elgin County is expected to be. Um, so that's as you can tell by the time we get to 2024. Or pardon me, 20. 44, um, which is the 20, 20 years from now, we are expecting the population, it's, it's projected to grow um, to approximately 60, 62,000 or 63,000 people. Um, so, and that's a very solid projection going upwards as well, too. Um, you can see that historically, the county's population flatlined um, in and around the 2010s. Um, and that was associated with some of the 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 the, the large employment uses having left um, Elkin County, specifically the the former Ford plant. Um, but that again, the the population projections have subsequently picked up. And again, those population projections are are uh, calculated based on um, based on um, the, what is called a cohort survival um, um, methodology. Uh, but uh, it, they were prepared by professional uh, professional demographers and and land economists. The chart that you see next to that um, is also related to one of the previous questions that was raised, which is understanding how much land each municipality or um, in, in Elgin County needs um, their gross developable land that is needed and whether or not that constitutes whether or not there's a, um, a surplus or deficiency of land supply 
um, to accommodate that projected growth. Um, so you can see that when we look at Central Elgin, um, Central Elgin needs, uh, according to the projections that were completed by the consultants, needs one, a little over 100, uh, about 106 hectares of land that was needed. Um, but the, the consultants also identified that notwithstanding those needs, the, Central Elgin has a surplus of lands by approximately 36 to 37 hectares of land. Um, so there's no need to, again, expand those boundaries, but certainly a local municipality could go about and rejig those boundaries and move some of those puzzle pieces around. So in total, we see that Elgin County over the 20 year period is expected to need approximately 325 hectares of land for urban uses um, and has a supply of 343.3 hectares of land for those uses. So overall, a surplus. And I do always want to highlight um, the, the deficiency, again, that exists in the town of Elmer of approximately 20 to 21 hectares of land. So within, the, within Chapter 2, some of the changes that were introduced into the plan, um, the schedules were updated to reflect the most up-to-date urban boundaries. So when we were looking at that previous map that I had brought up showing our different colors of pink in the municipality, as well as the white, um, the white rural area, um, those were updated to reflect all of the current municipal boundaries that exist within the local municipalities, including recently approved official plans such as South Wolds and Central Elgin. I had mentioned also about the tiering of the settlement areas that exist, the tier one, two, and three settlement areas. This was something that already exists within the official plan and was simply carried over into the new official plan as it did. still seemed a very reasonable approach um, to, to the structuring and directing of growth within, within, the, within the county. Uh, one of the new policies that was introduced is that um, the, the um, urban areas or settlement areas will only be permitted with uh, to, to expand their boundaries when they are on full municipal services. So again, growth is being directed to those tier one settlement areas, um, where tier two and tier three settlement areas, if they are brought, if full municipal services are brought to them, then, then expansions of those could be considered at appropriate times. We've also maintained the current approach to the redesignation of rural lands and the expansion of settlement areas. Um, much of this is really directed um, by provincial policy and there's very strict policies on how and when uh, rural lands can be redesignated for other purposes or settlement areas can expand. Um, so much of what you'll see in the plan are, is really direction that comes from the province. There's, there's, there's very, little discretion that ultimately municipalities have in Ontario for determining when they wish to expand their urban boundaries or um, the criteria for expanding urban boundaries or converting rural lands to other uses. The growth management section also includes a revised residential infilling and intensification target of a 16% of as opposed to the current 15%. I know that might seem like a very small tweak. Um, that's really a tweak to reflect um, the population projections and land needs assessment um, report that was completed by Hempson. This is a report we were speaking about earlier. Um, and really this is a target that municipalities are mandated to have in their official plans by the province of Ontario that attempts to direct some development and new development to existing areas to make sure that infrastructure is being used more efficiently to support downtowns, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're anticipating and targeting that across the county, over the course of the 20 year period, at least 16% of new development will be accommodated with by infilling or intensification of existing areas. Moving on to the third chapter, which is economic development. We've restructured the economic development policies to focus on the county's three major economic priorities, one being attraction and retention of industrial growth, the development of a healthy and vibrant agricultural sector, as well as the development of a healthy and active um, tourism sector. We've also identified employment areas throughout the county that are deemed to be of strategic importance to the county due to their size and location along with policies that protect these employment areas or essentially in planned industrial parks um, uh, from, from encroachment, from incompatible development, um, because they're located on important county routes or, uh, or inter, pardon me, 
intramunicipal routes or interregional routes, such as the county road system. We've renamed the existing tourism corridors designation that exists in the plan to scenic routes to better reflect their role um, and include policies that encourage high quality development along them. So there were certain routes um, on county roads within, within Elgin that were previously identified as tourism corridors. So these would be routes that, um, um, that were coming down from 401 interchanges or from the city of London where there was direction in the existing plan to encourage tourism uses and high quality development along those routes because they're gateways into the county and also to the county's tourism destinations, particularly along the, the, the lake shore. We've also expanded community improvement plan policies by clarifying what type of programming the county may jointly fund in conjunction with the local municipality. So under the Planning Act, um, municipalities are permitted to develop what are called community improvement plans to offer financial incentives and other type of um, incentive programming to private property owners um, for economic development and general community improvement or beautification purposes. So this is just a general clarification of what types of programming the county may want to jointly fund or participate in with a local municipality. Moving forward to chapter five, this is a focus on housing. So there's a distinction here between residentially designated areas and just housing as a general topic. And the focus of this particular chapter is on housing as a general topic. This is a new section that was created um, and consolidated a number of existing policies in the plan into this chapter um, to reflect its crucial importance to the county and to also recognize the fact that we are in a housing crisis. We've developed a new requirement for a mix of housing types in new subdivisions, whereby a minimum of 30% of new dwellings must be another form of housing other than single detached dwellings. So that could be things like semi-detached dwellings, row houses, duplexes, apartment buildings, et cetera. And the conditions under which this requirement could, could be waived. So this is an attempt to diversify the housing stock that exists in the county and to encourage developers to diversify their offerings to the county to improve affordability, but to also make sure that, um, that we have a housing stock that reflects the diversity of the needs of, of Elgin County's current and future residents, as well as the needs of those existing residents as they, they change, their households change throughout their life cycle, whether they live, they're living sing, uh, a single, whether they get Get married, whether they have children, when those children move out, when they retire and are looking to downsize. So again, it's an attempt to provide a more diverse housing stock to make sure that people can stay um, and plant roots down in the county over the long term. We've added new language around additional dwelling units to reflect recent changes to the Planning Act. So this is essentially um, the construction of apartments in housing and in existing houses. And we've also increased the plan's affordable housing target to 55% of all new homes. As 55% of the population of Elgin is classified as low and moderate income households under provincial policy and based on the analysis that we did of the most recent census data. So what this means is that when a new development proposal comes before county council, developers will be asked to um, will be asked to demonstrate how they're working towards achieving the target that 55% of all new homes in Elgin County will be affordable um, to, to to Elgin County's population to 55% of Elgin's county county's population. Continuing on on chapter four in housing, We've incorporated a new policy that requires local municipalities to incorporate policies in their plan, addressing the conversion of rental housing to home ownership, um, to, again, to preserve some of the rental housing stock that exists within the county. We've also introduced policies that encourage the county to explore affordable housing development on surplus lands and facilities. So these would be um, lands that the county may own, the county's agencies may own, or local municipalities may own, that when they are deemed surplus and maybe are being disposed of by that public authority, um, that we encourage council, the council of, of Elgin, as well as the local municipalities, to look at the opportunity to construct housing on those facilities and those lands that are no longer needed for their original purpose. We've also introduced policies that encourage the creation um, and set parameters around the creation of emergency shelters, 
transitional housing, as well as community housing. Community housing sometimes goes by the name of social housing. Um, so that's government, directly government owned housing that's being provided to, to low income populations. We've also introduced a policy to encourage coordination with higher levels of government to increase affordability of the housing supply in the county. Um, so working with the provincial and federal governments to ensure that there's a healthy and affordable supply of housing in the county. Moving on to the rural area, chapter five. So again, th this chapter is applicable to all those lands that you see in white within, within Elgin County. So that constitutes the, the county's rural and agricultural land base. And there are a number of major changes um, that, that occurred to this chapter. And a lot of this is due to um, changes in provincial policy over probably the last 10, particularly the last 10 years um, that have occurred. So we've reorganized and redrafted most of the policies to reflect these major changes to the provincial policy. Since the original plan was adopted, provincial policies now allow for a greater mix of uses in agricultural areas, such as agriculturally related uses, what they refer to as on-farm diversified uses. Um, and these policies were redrafted to, to, to permit um, these types of uses a county in the rural area. We've also introduced a policy to protect the rural character of the area, particularly when, when non-farm development um, is being proposed in the rural area. So that's kind of the unique and special qualities of, of, the, of the county's rural area that we're looking to preserve. We've introduced a policy that encourages new development to mitigate against the effects of climate change. And that is just an encouraging policy um, to support attempts by the private sector that if they're looking to, to mitigate against climate change that we, we would love to see that happen. And we're certainly supportive of those efforts. We've also maintained the existing minimum lot size of 40 hectares for farm parcels, and that's as per provincial policy. So once again, um, the, 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 the province of Ontario, um, through their own guidelines, dictates that they, they determine that a minimum farm parcel size, um, um, a viable farm parcel size is 40 hectares or 100 acres. So that would be the, we've maintained that, um, that, uh, that existing policy because it is directed by provincial policy. We've also maintained the existing prohibitions on residential lot creation and existing policies per permitting surplus farm dwelling severances as no substantive changes to the provincial policy have been introduced into the plan since they were originally adopted. And much of those policies are very strictly directed by, by provincial policy. So there's very limited leverage that council has to consider changes to those policies. Going on to the settlement areas and the policies that impact settlement areas. And again, so when we refer to settlement areas, those are our pink and purpley colored blobs that we see on the screen there. And they're essentially composed of the, the, counties, um, the counties, towns, villages, and hamlets. So with respect to the policy changes for settlement areas, We've clarified that local plans will be relied upon for most of the development policies within settlement areas. And the reason that we've done that is it's really just a recognition of what is feasible and reasonable um, in terms of the role that a county plan can play in directing um, the specific division or configuration of a local municipality. Um, we believe strongly that, that that role rests with the local council to determine the composition of their of their settlements, of their towns, villages, and hamlets. Um, there is a role for the county to play in it, but it's likely at a higher level. Um, so, so for the most part, local official plans will be left to direct the composition and makeup of local communities. We have introduced a new policy to protect overall urban character of the counties, towns, and villages, and this recognizes um, that, that, that the county has a number of very, again, unique um, and beautiful communities um, that people desire to live in, um, and that we want to see that unique character preserved as much as possible, even when we have to entertain at times um, residential intensification or large industrial proposals that may come in. We've established a new minimum net density of 20 units per net hectare in fully serviced settlement areas. Um, so that's to make sure that we have a minimum density when, when we're developing on municipal water and sewer to make sure that we're using that infrastructure efficiently and appropriately. Um, I would suggest and put out that for those that are trying to rationalize what, what 20 units, a minimum 20 unit per net hectare might look like on the ground, 
um, that's essentially a, a setting a floor of a lot that would be approximately 15 by 30 meters or approximately 50 by 100 feet, um, which is a lot that I would suggest um, is, is, is larger than what's typically being built. So what we're attempting here to do is just to set a minimum floor, like a floor of, 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 of density and those fully serviced settlement areas. We likely expect that development will be denser than that because that tends to be um, the nature of the development proposals that we're seeing these days. And we've also introduced a policy that encourages new development to mitigate again against the effects of climate change. Um, this is a similar policy to what you'll see in the rural area, and it's an encouraging policy. It's not a mandated po mandating policy. Moving on to chapter seven with respect to the natural system. So this is the map that you'll see associated with the natural system or the natural environment. Um, the green areas are natural heritage features that have been identified um, in, 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 in studies of, of, pardon me, the natural heritage study that was completed a few years ago. So that's composed of, um, the green areas composed of provincially significant wetlands, of areas of natural and scientific interest, um, and also of woodlands. You'll also note that we have also identified highly vulnerable aquifers as well as significant groundwater recharge areas as environmentally sensitive features um, because they are and there's a large amount of the rural area that depends on highly vulnerable aquifers and significant groundwater recharge areas as sources of drinking water um, when you have an individual well. Um, so, so we've introduced um, these as a layer onto the plan to make sure that we're properly identifying and mitigating against development that may not be suited um, to being located on significant groundwater recharge areas. So with respect to some of those policy changes, um, as I mentioned, the schedules incorporate the mapping contained in the Elgin County Natural Heritage Study while maintaining the minimum compliance with provincial policy um, with, with regards to protection of natural heritage. Um, so, so we are meeting the minimum requirements that are established by provincial policy with how, those, with how we protect woodlands and wetlands. Um, and we are not proposing any additional protections beyond what is being mandated by the province of Ontario. We've also clarified how development proposals within the natural system will be evaluated. This is an attempt to provide greater clarity to members of the public and the development industry about what's expected when you are proposing to develop next to or within a woodland or a wetland, et cetera. And we've also expanded upon the watershed planning policies and introduced policies that encourage the um, development of subwatershed studies and require that watershed considerations be taken into account when conducting environmental impact um, statements or, pardon me, assessments. But again, this is to ensure um, um, that we're employing best practices when we're looking at protection of the natural system. Finally, what's also, pardon me, what's also been introduced is the um, a forest coverage target of approximately 30% of the land base by the end of the planning period for the plan, which is 2044. Um, currently, the, the, the forest cover um, is, is well below that 30%. 30% is identified in most research as the, the minimum needed for, for biodiversity to, to thrive. We have had some discussions with County Council about this target and about the feasibility of reaching this target. We do consider it to be an aspirational target, and we do believe that we can start to work towards achieving that target um, through, through planting in new developments, um, through making sure that we take land dedications of, of, of naturally um, significant and important areas, um, again, there's no forced planting or, or forced removal of, um, pardon me, of, of dedications of any of these lands. Um, this is an aspirational target um, to, to shoot for, and we will be reporting on it to County Council every year. We've also clarified the limits of the natural system designations are not precise and that refinements to these boundaries do not require amendment. What that means is, is when we go back to, and I'm just going to jump back to, when we're looking at these green patches, we recognize that development might be proposed beside these green patches or adjacent to these green patches and that sometimes 
um, forests expand, sometimes they retract, sometimes water, uh, wetlands expand, sometimes wetland, um, sometimes they retract. And just because we have attempted to map them out, we're not attempting to force anybody through an official plan amendment to correct what might be ultimately a mapping error on the part of, 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 of our own mapping, or might be um, due to a change in the configuration of that natural feature. Again, the wetland expanding or contracting. We, we just, in those cases, we just don't want to be in a position where we're having to force people through an amendment to the plan um, because of the nature of a natural feature. We've incorporated a new requirement for compensatory restoration when natural areas are destroyed or removed through development. Um, so whether a natural area is going to be destroyed or removed um, legally because of a planning permission, or perhaps it was removed illegally, um, there's a requirement going forward that um, the development that development industry will be required um, to, to to provide compensatory restoration. So additional plantings to make up for those for the natural areas that are being removed or destroyed because of new development. We've incorporated a clarified requirement for hydro, hydrogeological assessments and cumulative impact assessments for subdivisions that are serviced by groundwater. This goes back to some of the, um, we were highlighting the, the um, sensitive groundwater recharge areas. Um, uh, so this is this would require um, developers who are going to be relying on groundwater to service their developments to conduct hydrogeological assessments and cumulative impacts assessments so we properly understand the impacts um, on of new development on the aquifers that they're going to be drawing from. We've also incorporated and clarified the requirement for geotechnical studies um, and assessments for subdivisions on septic systems, and again, to protect groundwater. So when we have sensitive groundwater um, recharge areas and, and septic systems are to propose to be used to service those, we wanna make sure that those septic systems are not potentially polluting that groundwater and are protecting it as drinking water for those that rely on it. Chapter eight is a focus on transportation and infrastructure systems. On this map, you'll see, um, if you can see those colored blobs, those represent um, source water protection areas. So those are intake zones for municipal wells and for the water distribution system. Um, so they limit certain types of incompatible development in those areas. Typically, it's quite often it's commercial or certain types of commercial and industrial developments that can be quite polluting that we do want to restrict in and around um, our water intake zones. This map also highlights the county road system and provincial road system and associated policies with it. Um, it also highlights the railway systems, um, active landfill sites that are located through the county. Um, and you can also see the tourism corridors with the dashes um, that were carryovers from the previous plan. So again, the, the, the focus of chapter eight is really around planning to deal with infrastructure and our transportation systems and all of the features that you see on these maps have associated policies with them within that chapter. So what do those policies look like? In terms of changes from, from the existing plan, we've incorporated a new county road design standards that arose, that arose from the county's draft transportation master plan. Um, so this is the, the design right of ways for county roads, whether they allow parking on them, um, where access points can be located on them, et cetera. We've clarified and streamlined the policies around how development that is not proposed on full municipal services is to be justified and assessed. Um, I, the existing policies we found to be kind of quite convoluted um, and they were causing quite a bit of confusion with both um, local staff, um, county staff, and also the development industry. So again, this is, I wouldn't suggest that there's anything groundbreaking in them. Um, we are following again, some of the direction from provincial policy on them, um, but it was an attempt to just kind of clean up the policies to make sure that they're clear for everybody to read. We've included the source water protection mapping on the land use schedules, as I had mentioned, because the previous plan predated um, source, the source water protection plan that came out um, after uh, as a result of Walkerton. Um, we've also clarified um, setbacks from railways um, and how they are to be employed. So the development of sensitive land uses adjacent to railway quarters. Um, and this is to reflect um, new national guidelines that were not in place when the current plan was adopted. Those were national guidelines that were developed by the Canadian Federation of Municipalities and the railway industry as a result of the Lac Megantic disaster. Um, so those guidelines about how sensitive land uses are to be located um, adjacent or near 
uh, near these railway corridors have been incorporated into the plan. We've also introduced policies for development adjacent to what is referred to often as linear infrastructures, so things like pipelines and hydro corridors, to clarify how the regulations of a Hydro One, a local uh, utility, or Exxon are to be incorporated into, into new development. And we've also incorporated noise exposure forecasts and noise exposure projection contours around the St. Thomas Municipal Airport um, on the land use schedules to make sure that um, people are aware of where against how sensitive land uses can be accommodated near um, airports to, and, and essentially to protect the airports and their functioning um, because the St. Thomas Municipal Airport is an important uh, economic generator um, and transportation um, facility within the county. Moving on to chapter nine, which refers to natural resource areas and management. Um, you'll see that we do have um, what I'm going to refer to as kind of some spotty mapping. This is mapping that we often have to rely on the province of Ontario to provide. You can see that there's not much in the, in the way that's been identified in Southwold um, Township. Um, and, and we are hoping that we may have some newer mapping that may come down from the province when they are when they're reviewing this and approving this that we might be able to incorporate into it. But this is essentially identifying the areas that are, um, have areas of potential aggregate resource. So um, um, sand and gravel, and also areas of potential pro petroleum resource, so whether that be natural gas or, or petroleum. Um, and there are policies that are located in this plan um, that, that essentially are there to protect um, a potential development of these areas for, for aggregates or for petroleum, um, for petroleum development. I would say that we have not introduced a ton of new policy um, or, or major changes to, to the natural resource management areas um, uh, within the plan. Most of this um, natural resource management is very much governed by um, other provincial policy and, and, and legislation, including the, um, the Aggregate Resources Act. Um, so there was kind of at the end of the day, uh, without kind of being flippant about it, not a ton of improvement that we saw. Um, to, to make to those policies. Um, they were good basic policies that were included in the plan. We're also in a situation where in Elgin County, um, and particularly this this area of southwestern Ontario, we tend to not have to deal with really, really disruptive um, aggregate operations like limestone quarries where they do blasting, et cetera, um, where in other parts of the province, such as in eastern and northern Ontario, that becomes much more of a larger issue. Um, so we've attempted to clarify and reorganize these policies to make sure that they are, again, easier to use, read and interpret, but we've not substantially altered these policies. Respect to chapter 10 with re reference to uh, development hazards. So this includes floodplain hazards, which are that uh, the beige highlighting that you see on, on your screen. So these are the lands that are regulated by conservation authorities um, because they have they contain steep slopes or they contain um, potential floodplain. Uh, this also regulates development around former landfill sites um, that are identified on that schedule by dots. Um, and also not shown on this map are this also contains this section also contains policies with respect to um, man-made hazards. So those can be things like uh, um, a former gas station that might be contaminated or a former factory where there may be maybe contamination in the ground. It's not feasible that we identify all of these sites on on the on the schedule. So we certainly we just have policies that direct that when we're when development is being proposed on a potentially contaminated, formally contaminated site, um, that um, that an assessment is made of that um, that assessment is made of that uh, contamination. So as a result of Bill 23, I know we had a question previously about Bill 23, a new policy was introduced to clarify how conservation authority regulations will be dealt with should the provincial government create regulations that exempt um, CA permitting when a planning act approval occurs. Um, so this is not something, and I can explain what that means. This is not something that's been um, introduced to date um, by the province. They have changed the legislation to, uh, that it can be enacted that um, if a planning act approval is required, then development may not need need a permit from a conservation authority. Um, so if we don't, if a permit is not needed by a conservation authority, we want to make sure that we're addressing those natural heritage issues, pardon me, those um, natural hazard issues within the planning act approval that we're undertaking. Um, this is an opportunity potentially to see um, this process streamlined. 
Um, but we've developed that policy just to make sure that we're catching a potential gap in permitting um, that may be as a result of, of, of Bill 23. We've also removed references um, to Conservation Authority shoreline management plans. Um, as these plans are primarily implemented by the respective conservation authorities and the local municipalities. Um, there was policies that, that govern shoreline management plans, but ultimately when we were reviewing them and our discussions with both the conservation authorities and the local municipalities, there was very kind of limited role um, for that, that that county plays in implementing those plans. And again, it was best thought that it was left best left to the local municipality and the conservation authority to regulate them and to implement them. And once again, uh, much of these policies were just reorganized and clarified, but not substantially altered because most of these policies um, are, are either directed by the province or come from direction from, from the authority under the Conservation Authorities Act. And we're coming to the end, uh, just a couple more chapters to go. Um, this one, uh, chapter 11, with respect to cultural heritage, um, we've clarified that cultural heritage um, protection is primarily a local matter, um, but that archaeological protection is primarily a county matter due to its potential cross-jurisdictional nature. So what we mean by that is we recognize in the county plan that while we certainly encourage local municipalities to conserve and preserve heritage buildings, structures, and landscapes that exist within their municipalities, that those local councils are best uh, with their communities are, are best suited to determine which buildings, landscapes, and sites should be protected under the Ontario Heritage Act. Notwithstanding that, because of our role in, in, um, in, in approving plans of subdivision and condominium, and because archaeological um, areas can cross municipal boundaries, and there is also a, um, an Indigenous component to, um, uh, to archaeological protection, uh, we felt it was best that that matter um, be dealt with primarily at the county level, and that the county was best, um, best suited to address the protection of archaeological resources in the county. We've simplified the language around how to determine an area of archaeological potential. So this is using the province's simplified checklist as opposed to requiring archaeological assessments every time a um, every time a new development is proposed. So we're hoping that we'll simplify and speed up some of those approvals. Um, and this is based on some of the um, some of the uh, newer implementation of the province's policies um, that again have simplified and and streamlined that process. We've also introduced new policies around Indigenous archaeological resources and the requirements to engage with nearby Indigenous communities when, we're, when we find their archaeological resources um, and developing uh, protocols around what we do when we find unexpected archaeological discoveries um, uh, when, when development is occurring. So and those can be emergency protocols and also protocols with local Indigenous communities. We've also introduced a policy that um, states that county council could at any time also consider the development of an archaeological master plan to further reduce some of the requirements on developers to complete archaeological assessments. And this is something that's permitted under the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, it is considered best practice. Um, and so we are encouraging county council at some time over the development or the implementation of the plan to, to consider the development of an archaeological master plan for the county. Moving on to chapter 12, review of development applications. Um, we've expanded existing policies on how development applications are be, to be reviewed, but no substantive changes have been introduced. That's primarily clarification, again, to try to make this simpler for people who are reading and interpreting the plan um, to, to implement it. We've introduced policies on when and how exempted condominiums and part lot control exemption applications can be considered and evaluated. Um, I won't go into great detail about what an exempted condominium or part lot control exemption is. Certainly, if there are specific questions on them, they're kind of more technical um, technical applications, but I'm certainly happy to, to clarify um, the, the policies that we've introduced. And again, that's just to provide some general guidance to council staff and, 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 and developers as to how we will proceed with those applications and to make sure that we're providing an opportunity for consistent decision making. We've clarified when severances may be applied for versus when a plan of subdivision is uh, um, as required, expanded the list of studies that may be required to form part of a complete application when a developer comes in and applies for new development, 
um, to make sure that we um, that county council and local councils have full discretion to determine uh, the types and nature of the studies that they wish to see being presented by by a developer. We've clarified that the county will determine who is uh, qualified to prepare required studies um, to make sure that professionals are undertaking the development of these studies and qualified professionals. And we've expanded Indigenous consultation policies, including the creation of an engagement protocol to assist the county and local municipalities with our duty to consult um, Indigenous communities, particularly our Indigenous neighbours. Primarily, overall, this was a reorganization and clarification of existing policies. And finally, the very last chapter that I would like to just provide an overview with, and we can jump to a Q&A period again, is chapter 13, where we end off in the plan, the implementation and administration. Um, and just a few highlights from this section. We've introduced policies to establish a planning advisory committee as required by previous changes to the Planning Act and what a terms of reference or what that planning advisory committee would do. Um, we've incorporated a new policy that requires annual reporting to County Council on achieving the goals and objectives of this plan. So some of those are achieving the intensification targets, forest cover targets, affordable housing targets. Um, so reporting on a regular basis to County Council and also to the local councils about how we're, we're meeting our targets and whether adjustments need to be made to either policies or to those targets to make sure that they remain relevant in the county and that we're working towards achieving, a progressively achieving um, of our, our goals, our county council's goals. And overall, again, this was we found that this in chapter 13, aside from those items, um, was primarily a reorganization and a clarification of existing policy. So with that, we'll jump back into a Q&A period. Again, if there are any questions that anybody has and would like to ask, you're certainly uh, welcome to raise your hand. I think that we may have one or two questions in the, the chat box. Um, and, and I'm not sure if we may have one or two questions from audience members in the council chambers. So uh, I'm not sure if we wanted to start, maybe we could start in the council chambers this time. Um, and our, our friends there, if there's any questions or comments people would like to ask. I know there's a lot of information. I apologize if it, if it went a little quickly, but uh, certainly happy to return to any of the slides um, uh, that, that we covered. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm wondering if you can provide some clarification in your recommendations around affordable housing, specifically your recommendation to increase the percentage of affordable housing units to 55%. What definition of affordable housing have you based that recommendation on? Certainly. So uh, affordable housing, and I would have to pull up the document, but affordable housing is a defined term under provincial policy, as are the populations that that um, that are identified as, as being in need of affordable housing. And so essentially, um, it's affordable housing is determined to be housing that's that's intended for people who are of low or moderate income. Um, so when we look at the definition in provincial policy of, of populations that are uh, low or moderate income households, and we compare that to the census data that exists that was just completed um, in the last census in 2021, 55% um, of Elgin's County's population are defined as being of low or moderate income households. Um, so the, the, the reason that affordable housing target of 55% was identified is because 55% of Elkins population um, is, 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 is classified as being of low or moderate income households. So we're looking to create housing stock and target housing stock, which people who currently live in and reside in Elgin County um, can, can access. Um, and so that, that, that was the methodology behind that. Thank you for that explanation. Just a further follow up then. Of is course. It your, is it your intention that those targets would be met on a per application basis or is the county hoping to reach a cumulative 55% which may in fact be achieved through a 100% affordable housing development and others with lesser proportions of affordable housing? 
Certainly, it would be this. It would be the latter. So the expectation is not that every development that is going to be constructed in Elgin County is going to contain fifty five percent affordable housing, but that we'll be working on a wide range of different types of development. Some which may have um, minimal affordable housing component, and some which, as you as have you just mentioned, maybe one hundred percent affordable housing. So we'll be tracking progress to that fifty five percent target year after year on a cumulative basis. Um, so not every development proposal that will be received by the County of Elgin is anticipated or expected to contain 55% affordable housing. The, I'm hoping that um, clarified. On that question, the 55%, was that, was that changed after the announcement last year? So the, it, it, so it hasn't changed based on the announcement last year. That 55% is based on the definition of uh, that's contained in provincial policy of affordability, um, gear, which is geared towards um, low and moderate income households. Um, and, it's, um, and it's based on the 2021 census data. So th that's the most recent data that we have to understand um, the, 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 the household incomes that exist. Um, so we were basing it on th the most recent data. I'm not sure if there are any other questions in the council chambers, but maybe uh, Mike, Jesse, did you, I'm not sure if yep. anybody online has a has a question that you wanted to. Yeah, uh, so we had a question here that's uh, it's been marinating for a bit, but uh, so we apologize for that, but it was quite Hello. early. Um, so we do have a question again about the affordability targets. Um, so the question reads, uh, you have affordability targets, but what legislative ability does the county have to obtain the target? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm going to be quite frank in my answer, um, the, the, the local, uh, the county council or local municipalities have very little legislative um, authority or ability to enforce that. Um, that is, at the end of the day, we negotiate with individual developers and county council and local councils do this to encourage and to try to get developers to, um, to consider um, uh, the development of affordable housing, but ultimately there are no powers under the Planning Act um, or and no powers that have been provided by the province of Ontario to either county council or to a local council to enforce that or essentially force a, a the, the meeting of a target. Um, so that's going to have to come, um, the, the, the achieving of that target is going to have to come through a multi-pronged approach of, of development incentive, of, of encouraging and of development um, and also of development control through the, our normal subdivision and, and condominium processes. Um, it's a it's a bit of a nuanced approach. Uh, there are probably pros and cons to being able to enforce that target um, and having legislative tools to enforce that. But there's very few tools that uh, that that a local or county uh, council has to, to to force that target to be met. We don't have any more questions in the uh, in the chat. That's it. Okay, very good. Uh, maybe we can go back to the council chambers. Go ahead, Mark. Yes, thank you. This, here to Paul. Paul, for a developer to put in affordable housing, does it really have to be subsidized by some form of government to make it, you know, cost efficient, and make it profitable for the builder? Because we're talking about a lot of homes, but if nobody's going to do it because there's no money in it, what's the answer? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it it is a really great question, um, and and I and if I could be frank, I think some of that is 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 a question that the development community has to answer. Um, ultimately, they're the ones that identify what their profit margins are, um, and 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 what a return on investment from the development of an individual house or a plan of subdivision looks like, um, and. We don't have too much control over how they develop their pro formas um, or market forces to that end. Um, so again, what we can do to try to encourage the development industry to construct more affordable housing um, is to let them know what if, what price thresholds exist for affordable housing, to make sure and try to incorporate policies that encourage a diverse range of, of, of housing to be provided, 
So uh, not, not not all just single detached dwellings, but to encourage semi-detached row houses, low rise apartments that um, because they're a reduced footprint um, are ostensibly more affordable than a, a larger single detached uh, dwelling. Um, but, but ultimately it's going to depend on us negotiating county and local staff negotiating and councils negotiating with, with the development community and to try to encourage the development of that housing. But it, it's a great, it's a great conundrum and a great question because ultimately it's a it's the development community that knows what their profit margins are knows what their return on investment is and they establish that not an easy answer not a, not an easy question to answer but but it's a it's a great question uh we have a hand raised here uh, sure. Suzanne so I'm gonna I'm going to unmute you there. So you should be able to unmute yourself, Suzanne, if you'd like to, uh, to ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. So I'm uh, just going to direct. Um, I don't have a fully formulated question. I'm, but I want to, obviously I, I'm, my concern is, is around, uh, the watershed planning. Sure. And development on partial services, given my um, concerns in the past and mm -hmm. would consider a lack of appropriate watershed scale studies in order to support mm -hmm. development and to um, look at the cumulative develop um, pressures on groundwater resources drinking water resources both on development demands and um and climate change so when i'm looking mm -hmm. at i'm not really sure what the, uh like policy 7.4 i don't i'm not really sure how the county is viewing that and then furthermore where it's going specifically in 713, where the development proposals are supposed to have hydrological assessments, given that the hydrological assessments in the past have been site specific, they do not address uh -huh. uh, the long-term or cumulative impacts, nor do they address the impact of the development uh, of, of the climate change on the viability of the aquifer over the long-term. So I'm not seeing any policies in here that I'm reading that are any different from the past. Um, and, and perhaps you can clarify perhaps how, because this is just general writing and it's terms on how things are going to be, to be um, implemented, who's implementing, who's making the definitions and, yeah. and going forward. Sure. So, I mean, a couple of comments. Um, I, I, I'd actually suggest that some of the policies or the majority of the policies that we've developed around watershed planning um, and 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 development on 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 groundwater are actually quite different than 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 are in the existing plan. Um, the existing plan did not have requirements for cumulative groundwater assessments or even requirements that a, a hydrogeological study be undertaken. Um, they had a requirement, and you might be familiar with it, they had a requirement for a, um, a settlement area capability study, which was not a defined study or a defined term, um, and was a, a, I guess we were, I think staff were often at a loss of how this was to be implemented. So what we've done in the new plan is um, is, is a couple of things, and I, I brought us back to this land use schedule here um, because one, we are identifying uh, the highly vulnerable aquifers and the significant groundwater recharge areas. Um, so these areas are now mapped in the county plan. So we know where we do have potential issues with groundwater and development that relies on groundwater. We certainly see that um, particularly along the Thames River, which forms the northern boundary along West Elgin, Dutton Dunwich and into Southwold. And we see it very much so um, in BAM and in the southern portion of Malahide. Um, so one, we've, we've gone out to identify um, these, these sensitive groundwater areas to begin with and to make sure that they're designated and noted in the plan. We've also are requiring that when development is to proceed on the basis of, of groundwater, that aside from just undertaking a hydrogeological study, that a cumulative impact 
um, uh, a groundwater study is required for new development to make sure that we understand the full cumulative impacts on the aquifer when development is being proposed on that. Um, I feel strongly that we are plugging a gap, a policy gap that existed within the existing plan. Um, and I, I, I'm quite pleased that we're, we, we, we've been able to do that. Um, the, the, the other thing that we've also incorporated into the plan is, um, as, is establishing the need to undertake um, a series of sub watershed studies to make sure that ultimately or to encourage county council and local councils in the development industry to make sure that we have fully accounted for um, um, uh, the composition of our sub watersheds um, across the county. Um, and once we've got sub watershed studies completed, that will further uh, inform and enhance the um, the assessments, the hydrogeological assessments and the cumulative groundwater assessments that are being proposed, um, that are being required for development when on, on groundwater. Um, I certainly, and I know that I believe that we probably had some discussions about this in the past, and, and it's certainly with with regards to some of those specific policies, very happy um, to, to have a conversation with you about it um, um, offline. But I just kind of wanted to uh, bring to your attention some of those highlights, um, because I, I I, I believe we've chatted about this before, and some of the some of the policy changes that have been incorporated into the plan um, are a direct result of some of those those previous conversations. And yes. so I'm very hopeful that some of that is is, is meeting some of the the expectation that you have in that in that regard. I guess is where I should be should be going with that. Sorry, Susan, I'm passing it back to you. Absolutely, uh, that's that's really good news. Um, the watershed planning. Uh, so uh, the other concern I think we'd had a discussion a couple of years ago by now was mm -hmm. on who's paying for these watershed studies. It's a large scale and uh, it, it really does provide a basis for any type of um, development yes. or, uh, um, but the, it, it's costly. So I'm, um, I'm seeing that this is required, but I'm, I probably, I, maybe it's in the policy here, but I, I, I apologize. I skimmed nope. for it rather than read it in detail. Yeah, well, you don't have to apologize, and and you're not wrong. Um, there's no, there's nothing in in the plan that dictates who's going to pay for the sub watershed study or any study that's really required of development. Um, so the the answer to that is is really two part, and it really depends on who's going to undertake the study. Um, so so there is there are policies that encourage the county and local municipalities to work with conservation authorities to develop those studies. So in those cases, ostensibly, it would be a joint financial effort on the part of the local municipality, the conservation authority, and the county um, to pay for and lead the development of those studies. In the second um, part of that would be, in some instances, we may be in a situation where um, before a development can move forward, that it's appropriate to see a sub-watershed study completed. And Central Elgin, in particular, actually has some very strong policies in their official plan requiring the development of sub-watershed studies in advance of development, where a development proponent um, is causing or or we require a subwater study to be subwatershed study to be completed because of the development proposal, then that that cost should be borne by the applicant in those cases. So the developer should be paying for that because we do ostensibly operate under that principle of development should pay for itself. Um, so it, it really kind of depends on the context on that one. Okay. May I may I ask one more question? Abs absolutely. Uh, regarding, again, it's more or less mapping. Um, I find appropriate mapping is uh, useful for people in development and any other situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you for your natural, your hazard areas, um, I see, for example, there's dynamic beach hazards, but when I've spoken to the um, to the Long Point Region Conservation Authority, they actually said there was no dynamic beaches in in Elgin County. So I'm wondering. Um, usually, we're only showing the regulated areas, and then you ask for specific areas where different hazards are. But this this is yes. a good overview. It would really help if I I believe if we had mapping, whether it be online or or, or hard copy that would be able to identify the erosion hazards and other hazardous lands and what those hazards are the lakeshore 
hazards, mm-hmm. the uh, uh, this. I just I this is yeah, la- I, sorry, Suzanne. I, do you no, know I it? I just said it's lacking, and I would like. And my comment really is that I would like to see these types of hazards mapped um, so that there is no question. I know it's dynamic and sometimes it's it's moving, but that it, it brings into question too for for development where they said, well, what kind of hazard is there? And, and because the conservation authority actually doesn't do the mapping themselves, that question is not easily answered um, mm-hmm. because it's outside consultants and, and it's always a, a quite a few removed. Mm-hmm. It's so and that's a great comment. Um, I, I, so I think there's two things I'd probably mention with that is one of the struggles that we often have with um, with mapping in any official plan and particularly for like these large geographic areas like Elgin County when we are undertaking kind of a regional map um, is eventually we do have to print the document and, and so there is that kind of general question of legibility on the maps. Um, but to your point in wanting to make sure that um, any member of the community, whether you're a, a development proponent or whether you're just an interested community member wanting to find out the type of hazard or the type of natural feature um, that they might be operating in, um, I think that's certainly something that I'd love to take back to the county's um, GIS department to make sure that we've got accessible um, um, uh, d- uh, portals um, and, and accessible um, online mapping that, it, you know, if you do want to know what type of hazard that you, you're running into, that you could go on to, um, you know, the, the, the county's online GIS system and look that up. Um, I, you know, it's a, it's a great comment to make. Um, we're certainly large proponents of wanting to see as much data shared and as openly as possible. Um, so I'm certainly happy to take that 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 message back to to county council um, and to the county's GIS department. That would be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No problem at all. And so I'm wondering, maybe we we can do another um, round. We've got about a half hour left in the session. We certainly don't have to take it all up if there are questions. I see somebody standing at the podium, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> if there's any groundwater taking changes for agriculture in the water, um, aquifer rights. Um, so there are no policies in the plan with respect to water taking um, for for agricultural operations. Uh, m- m- that is normally governed by um, the Ministry of the Environment and Ministry of Agriculture and Food. They have their own separate permitting system for that. Um, so there's there's that would have to be taken into account when undertaking hydrogeological assessments or cumulative groundwater assessments um, for for new development. But that individual permitting is something that rests with the with the province of Ontario. I hope that uh, I hope that answered that question. So again, maybe um, I, it, I'm not sure if there's say we can if there's anybody else who is present in the council chambers that wanted to ask a question. Maybe just to, we can do another round of, uh, of not seeing anybody coming to the table. Maybe uh, Jesse, I'm not sure if you, there are any raised hands in the audience or anything in the chat. Nope, it's pretty quiet. That's it. All good. Very good. So. At this point, perhaps then um, I, I'll, I'll move on to a little bit of next steps. If there are any other questions that pop into anybody's head while I'm kind of covering uh, the, 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 the kind of the concluding slides, um, I certainly am happy to for us to break and to return to a question and answer period. Um, we do have until seven o'clock. If, if there are any other questions, we certainly can break early if there aren't. But I just I want to make sure that we're not rushing anything and that anybody that does have a question has that opportunity to ask. Um, but in terms of the next steps in this process, I'm going to revisit our slide um, that I showed earlier in terms of the, the, the process um, for how this plan was approved um, and that we've gone from the issue scoping to undertaking our background analysis uh, throughout 2022, the drafting of the plan through 2022, 2023, and we're now into that final phase, the last phase, which is review and adoption into the spring. So we're currently in that last phase of the plan's development. 
which means that we're in the final stages of gathering the input and the feedback on the proposed plan before County Council adopts it and sends it to the province for approval. So what that looks like is that if you would like to provide feedback on the proposed plan, um, you can first log on to engageelgin.ca uh, backslash official plan review, where you will find a copy of the final draft of the official plan. Um, you'll also find that along with the uh, original population projections report and land needs assessment that was done, um, as well as the addendum that came post VW plant and any of the other papers um, and, and background reports that were prepared in the development of, of, of the official plan. After reviewing the documents, um, you can provide any comments or feedback you have on the plan in one of two ways. First, you can provide written comments by email to at opreview at elgin.ca. That's opreview at elgin.ca. Alternatively, you can, you can attend the statutory public meeting that's planned to be held next week on March the 26th at 5 p.m. at the council chambers. Um, it will also be streamed um, just the same way that this meeting is being streamed, where you will be given the opportunity to speak and make any oral submissions on the proposed plan or oral comments on the proposed plan. This will be uh, that, that opportunity on the 26th, which you, again, you're welcome and encouraged to attend if you'd like to make any submissions um, is a bit more of a formal uh, way of making uh, comments they, that will then form part of the public record um, that will be uh, presented to County Council and presented to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing when they're looking at adopting and subsequently approving the plan. Um, we are requesting that if you are planning on providing any written comments to opreview at elkin.ca, um, that you provide your uh, written comments or otherwise in writing by, by March 26th um, um, at the end of day. Um, after which what we'll be doing is we'll be taking the feedback that we heard this evening, we'll be taking the feedback that we've heard throughout the commenting period through the past um, month or so, um, as well as the comments that are being provided at the statutory public meeting. And what we do is we create a big long chart um, to advise County Council of everything that we've heard and what, what has been said um, and what we've got requests to edit, change or refine with. And we'll provide a response to each one of those um, comments or submissions that are made um, to make sure that County Council has all the information in front of them when they're making a decision on the plan as to whether or not they want to incorporate those changes um, or whether they're satisfied with the work that's been done to date. Um, so that's just, again, just, um, just some information on the immediate next steps. But I do want to highlight it has been a long journey for the county and county council. Um, so we are in the final stages um, of it. So if you do have any comments or questions that you'd like to provide, we just want to encourage that you do that sooner and later to make sure that they're they're um, they're included um, for county council's consideration. County council will not be considering adopting the plan on the on March twenty sixth. That's simply. Um, a public meeting to hear comments on it. We'll then write a report and bring it back to County Council at a later date um, with, with, the, with the comments that have been made. Um, so with that, I might pause once again, just to ask if there are any other questions or comments that people wanted to ask before we break for the day. Um, so maybe we can start back in our council chambers. Um, so our team over in the council chambers, if there's anybody that wanted to come up to the podium and ask any other questions. On anything that was covered tonight, I want to stress that. Beer is mud. Very good. Seeing none, maybe we'll pass the mic over to Jesse, who's been monitoring the the attendee, the virtual attendees. Any hands up or anything in the chat, yeah. Jesse? Yep. Uh, we have Suzanne again uh, with her hand up, so I'm just going to activate her mic and I'll let her uh, her speak. For sure. There you go, Suzanne. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Since there's time, I thought I'd ask the one last question, and it's on a specific policy. Of on course. 7.13B. Again, we're talking about um, development uh, where the drinking water source may be work, um, out of, from groundwater. The policy is saying may rather than shall. And it also isn't defining what exactly uh, would, what's the definition, what are the guidelines and what are the, what's the guidance on what type of a hydrological assessment, what would be an acceptable, 
I think I heard you say at one point you were going to develop more criteria on what was required for development proposals and and the sort of criteria under that. Is that going to be included in that list? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll start off with the first question with respect to why, why we've incorporated may versus shall. Um, and that's to uh, uh, permit um, a little bit of flexibility when we're looking at essentially individual proposals versus um, an individual house proposal versus a plan of subdivision. So when we have an individual house that may be constructed in an area where there's a sensitive, um, a sensitive groundwater, is we may not necessarily need a full scale hydrogeological assessment to determine whether or not um, that one individual house located in the country can be built. And it is likely just as sufficient to have a well drillers report to, 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 to be submitted to indicate that there is sufficient water supply that's located there. So that's the reason for that flexibility. The intention of that proposal is to always ensure that when we're talking about development, urban scale plans of subdivision and condominiums that are being built um, within a settlement area, um, that, um, that, that a hydrogeological, a normal standard hydrogeological assessment be completed and submitted along with that development. To the question then you bring up with respect to what's that criteria, what does that terms of reference look like? Um, the county has a couple of options when they're looking at that. One, there are a number of municipalities that often get relied on for their terms of references um, for, for the completion of these studies. Um, quite often we'll see that, particularly in rural areas, they'll often rely on kind of the, uh, the, the closest um, major urban center. So in this case, the City of London will ostensibly have a terms of reference for how the City of London expects a hydrogeological study to be completed. And we will rely on that as well as the county's peer reviewers to work through what um, the scope and terms of reference should be for a, a, a hydrogeological assessment. Alternatively, county council does have the opportunity to go out and develop their own uh, terms of reference for that. Those terms of reference are those criteria for what should be included in a hydrogeological study and not or what should be included in a market study or what shouldn't, or what should be included in a sun or shadow study or a servicing study. We typically don't include those within an official plan because it would become too cumbersome to read, um, but they are adopted as separate, um, separate guidelines for how to develop each one of these studies. Um, so the county does have the option of one, relying on another municipality um, who has a, you know, who has developed, already developed a terms of reference with criteria um, as, as the, to form the basis. And then we certainly work through with the developer and our own peer reviewer what, um, what the actual scoping of the study should look like. Or county council has the option of developing their own unique set of criteria for, for a hydro, hydrogeological study or any other type of technical study that's required. I hope, I'm, I hope that provides some clarification. I'm not sure if you have any follow up on that. I would... I just would think there's some provincial guidelines that that I was thinking should be pointed to sure. as a guideline sure. as well. And um, sure. that is at one point. And then the second thing is the development by consent. Um, yes, they're individual lots, but they're happening consecutively. And it's um, the number of consent applications is becoming concerning for the um, the drinking water aquifers viability over the long term. Sure. No, and I, I certainly appreciate appreciate when we're going through multiple consents in an urban area, one property next door to the other. Um, that is uh, something certainly that I, I I am very rarely in support of um, uh, when when undertaking development review because for the very reasons that you just stated. Um, what I'm referring to is really when we're talking about lot creation in a rural area. So we may have a surplus farm dwelling severance um, that that is that has occurred or a one-off lot that uh, a, a, what we call a lot of record a vacant lot within the rural area that um that a new house could be constructed on um that's really those those individual instances that were that um that um a well of drillers report may be sufficient but i certainly understand what you're saying um and again i would encourage you to please uh, put these thoughts down in writing to make sure that we can we can fully review them um and and that they're in front of county council okay thank you 
Of course. Um, any any others on your end, Jesse? Uh, no, I think we just do have a note to just double check to make sure that the uh, that the uh, that the links are uh, are working. But I I think uh, we can we can do that offline. We can so certainly no, no do that. Questions. Absolutely. Thanks. And thanks for pointing that out, uh, Brad. Much appreciated. And maybe we'll do a last call then over back in the council chambers. Hearing none. And perhaps I will move on to that last slide, um, which again brings us to the end of this evening's open house. Um, so on behalf of County Council and staff, I would like to thank you uh, for attending this evening, for your interest in the official plan project, um, and very much look forward to receiving any comments or feedback that you have. Um, again, encouraging you that if you do want to provide some written feedback, you can send it to opreview at elgin.ca. Um, you're more than welcome to also attend next week's statutory public meeting. It's a bit more of a formal setting than this. Um, and if there are any questions that come up in the meantime, you will find contact information um, for, uh, for, for Paul Clark, uh, who can relay your comments or questions to, to the project team. You can find his contact information on the engageelgin.ca um, website as well, too, under OP review. Um, you'll see his phone number and his email address there. So with that, I, again, would like to, uh, again, thank you on behalf of County Council and staff and uh and uh i wish everybody a an enjoyable rest of your evening and uh hope to hear from you soon thanks all thank you paul a great night